Hello everyone, I'm Mark Camp with Brownfield Ag News, welcoming you to our Pioneer Harvest Hangout featuring Andy Ross and Don Kyle. And as we begin, Andy, let's get to know you and Don a little bit more. Talk about your role with Pioneer as a plant breeder. Sure. So Andy Ross, um, I got involved in plant breeding early on. I worked for DeKalb when I was a kid and uh, kind of under figured out what it, what, what it meant to be a corn breeder. It was amazing to me that there was these people um, throughout North America that were coming up with hybrids and they were the ones that were actually putting inbreds together to make hybrids to go into farmers fields. And I said, you know, that sounds like something I would be really interested in doing. And uh, I asked a corn breeder at the time, I was like, hey, how can I do what you do? And uh, he said, go to Iowa State, get your bachelor's degree in agronomy and your master's and PhD in plant breeding, and then you can do what I do. And it was very good advice for a 16 year old kid. So um, that was the background. I went to Iowa State, became an agronomist first, then a plant breeder second, um, and learned how to put corn hybrids and soybean varieties together. Right after graduate school, I got to work for Pioneer, um, and I've been working with Pioneer for the last 20 years. It's kind of my background in pi how I got started in plant breeding anyways. Don, how about for you? What's a day in the life look like? Yeah, well, um, you know, a day in the life for a plant breeder, uh, it, it varies a lot, just like a farmer, honestly, because it's changing with the seasons. But, you know, spend a good bit of time in the field from the time we start planting till the time we finish harvest, uh, getting a lot of observations on material. But, you know, the world of plant breeding has evolved a lot in the last 15 to 20 years. And so uh, there's a lot of data to really analyze in the office these days too, from a genomic standpoint. And so marrying together what we learn in the field from what we measure, and then trying to understand what's going on inside the plant with those different genetics and figuring out that combination. So, uh, you know, anymore, it's uh, probably half and half time in the field and then half the time in the office uh, uh, to try to understand and interpret the data. Andy, that probably partially at least answers my next question as far as what differentiates a plant breeder from an agronomist? Yeah, I mean, so in general, most plant breeders, the foundation is agronomy um, and be, being an agronomist. Um, the, the next step of being a plant breeder is really about being able to understand the genetics and statistics around trying to find that next better uh, genetic gain. And so a lot of what plant breeders do is uh, think about how to increase yields and stabilize those yields for growers. And the, the great thing about a plant breeder's job is you're, you're focused on what is happening in the current crop cycle, but you're also looking about the next two to three and then three to seven years ahead on what do you need to do to help growers in the future and meet them where they're going to be seven, seven years from now. Don, anything you'd add to that as far as what is different between a, a breeder and an agronomist? Yeah, just reemphasize Andy's point. It's really just looking farther down the road. And so understanding what, what the environment, what the management practice is, what the customer needs will be five, 10 years out in front of us and trying to develop that product. Um, and, you know, we're not always ahead of uh, customers asking us for that product. Uh, we'd like to be, but that's that's one of our jo jobs is to make sure we're trying to look far enough down the road to develop a product before it's needed um, and deliver it when it's needed. Andy, kind of staying on that theme of, of differentiating, what would you say sets Pioneer apart from other seed companies from uh, a breeding perspective? Yeah, so one of the key things I think that that Pioneer has with our breeders is we are we are out and intermersed with the growers and the sales reps. And we, um, we make it a very pointed effort to have our breeders spread throughout all the states in the corn region where we plan to develop products. And there's, it, it, that's done with very intentional purposes and that is to maintain accountability. So from the time I wake up in the morning and see the, you know, see the fields that I drive past with pioneer signs on it and our competitor signs on it, I know if there's crop issues that are going on the same day they happen to the growers. So, um, and if there's successes, we share the successes and we share the uh, the issues as throughout the crop cycle. So, th that would be that would be one thing is we really maintain that local connection between our breeders, our agronomists, the sales reps, and the growers. 
Don, what else sets Pioneer apart? Well, you know, we're an organization that, you know, is thinking pretty locally when we're doing breeding, but we're also looking at the big picture because that's one way that we're able to make sure we deliver stable products is looking across a broader area and recognizing issues and opportunities along the way. And I think that connectivity uh, very locally, but then our connectivity within our breeding community, even globally, really helps us deliver those products that help our customers the most. A question for both of you, and maybe this year is a good example of how you work with growers and what that might look like as you problem solve. Yeah, I would say the best answer to that is just as an example is that connection. So usually when you're that close and you're, you're out in the community, um, one of our breeders, at, when sales reps have issues with a grower, they know where to go grab a plant breeder to come and explain, explain an issue or help solve an issue at uh, maybe a different level than they're comfortable with. And so we get the opportunity to visit customers that are happy or unhappy with the product and be able to work them through it. The great thing about, about that scenario is, is that we quickly learn what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. So the learning process is fairly quick to, for us of um, what makes good product for our customers. There's uh, no telephone game to work, work through the system. We, we hear direct feedback. And Don, I would imagine that whether you're working directly or indirectly with a grower, you have common goals. You're kind of shooting for the same things, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. We are. And that accountability or relate that's developed through that relationship with the customer is really important. And, you know, as a plant breeder, it would be maybe easy for us to develop products. And once they advance to a commercial product, we don't really worry about them anymore. Um, but that's really not true because when you're locally connected and you run into somebody at church or at, at school or something else and they ask you about a soybean variety or a or corn hybrid and want your opinion on it, it really matters to know, you know, it, it's important to know what you're talking about because you're, you're giving them advice. Uh, just the same as one of our agronomists or sales reps would be. And so really understanding, you know, our product pipeline as it gets in the hands of growers is important. And that feedback you get from that, because you'll, the more those relationships develop, you know, the more opportunities you'll get to understand that customer needs vary. And some folks are okay with uh, varieties that maybe need more management and some of them want something a little more bulletproof that's a little more hands-off that you know just a very stable product and and so you find out that you know really a mix of products is what's needed and and helping those customers uh, find that product and, and achieve the results they want with it. Andy we'll probably spend more time on this later in the conversation but as far as what you think sets your area unique a little bit and, and the benefit of being as local as you are. What are some distinctive characteristics, if you will? About the areas. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, we're, I would say Don and I as plant readers have really good relationships with our product agronomists and we get exposed to how our products are handling different areas um, throughout Iowa. And so, you know, we often define, um, corn growing regions as state boundaries. But for plant breeders and agronomists, we get down way deeper than that. And so, you know, just take Iowa, for example. Um, Iowa had a very unique environment depending on which set of counties you were in. The western side of Iowa this year was dry, lacked rain. Eastern, northeast and eastern sides were more of a garden spot. And just depending on the amount of rainfall that we got in the 2022 growing season. And so depending on each of those areas, it's really the the customers experience a different growing season um, just in Iowa alone. Now, our job in making products is um, is really that's the challenging and fun part is to come up with products that can handle each one of those unique environments, whatever the year throws at us. And Don, kind of building off of that, I'll talk to farmers who from field to field, you might see a pretty dramatic change in moisture throughout the growing season, a crop that's performed a lot different, just a neighboring field. I mean, it, it is uh, pretty remarkable how, depending on conditions, there, there can be drastic differences. 
Yeah, that's right. And, you know, our, our products get tested wide area so that we can hopefully mitigate that instability and try to find those issues before they ever end up in a customer's field. Because, you know, I, uh, there's a thing called G by Y or genetics by year interaction. And, um, you know, I've always viewed plant breeding, my role as a plant breeder is to help minimize that, to reduce, because we don't know what next year is going to be. And so I want to reduce the influence that next year has on these genetics and make sure these genetics are built to handle that year regardless of what happens and perform stably across the other years. Andy, kind of patting Pioneer on the back a little bit, but I think it's important to this conversation. You talked about the, the network of dealers, the agronomists that you work with. I mean, it is a sizable footprint and you can tap into that and they can tap yeah. into you. And it's, it's an amazing funnel from the time, you know, that you go from the plant breeders and the plant breeding, the research team that we have spread out across North America and the Corn Belt. And then you go and step into 160 some project agronomists or agron field agronomists. And then they're supporting 2,200 or more field sales reps, uh, sales reps that are connected with growers. It's, uh, it's quite the network that makes sure that we get constant feedback on our products. So, and most importantly, being able to service those products. And so, you know, we, we don't necessarily, uh, we pride ourselves in trying to come up with a hybrid that can go anywhere and do anything. A lot of times to get the best out of any product though, you know, there's some recipes that come with it. And if we can help a grower um, put those products on the best areas of their farms or regions to get the most value out of them, we want to make sure that we, if we know that, we want to communicate that all the way to the grower. And so that's a lot of what our service organization does is communicate what we know about products all the way to the grower. Don, what is this time of year like for you and others at Pioneer? Most of the crop is in the bin and you're gathering information from the growing season. What's that like? What, how busy is it this time of year? Well, it's slowing down now that it's uh, late November. And thankfully it is because the last three months have been crazy busy. Uh, as we watch this crop uh, hit its final stages in grain fill and go through maturity and then, um, you know, get those final observations from the field and meet a combine. And then it's just a blur for about, I don't know, four or five weeks of just analyzing and crunching data because uh, the party never stops, honestly. Even though our growing season is over here in North America, we've just cycled a bunch of material to get planted in some off-season nursery or South America. And so we're, we're moving that seed down there. Our teams have been busy moving seed to their, their off-season locations. And um, gosh, here, here in another week, I think we'll be setting up experiments for 2023. So we'll, we'll just get the analysis done on last year's experiments and get seed moved and next year begins, so. Andy, how would you describe harvest? You know, harvest is a, is a blur. There are, from the time we start looking at corn at the end of August and seeing the different characteristics of um, our current product lineup and then all the new things that we have to offer for the next, you know, uh, one to four years back from a grower. Uh, it's an amazing amount of, uh, <laughs> information you can collect both um, through the combines and then also by just walking corn. I mean, I would say the thing that the, one of the best parts of my job as a plant breeder is to be able to walk corn in the fall, uh, being able to understand the different characteristics and seeing what's acceptable and what's not and being part of those decisions to actually commercialize or move better, better genetics and better hybrids uh, forward for growers. And so, but it's, it's an intense time from September through basically the first part of November. Uh, like Don said, it's very much looking at tons of data and putting all our notes together to make sure that we're picking the best hybrids to go forward. And then- And before we, oh, go ahead. Well, just to add on to what Don was saying, you know, one of the key things that people um, probably don't realize is the amount of effort that we spend. We really do spend two cycles. We, we do a growing season that our growers, we share with the growers in North America. And then we produce tons of seed in South America so that we get just in time new experimental hybrids produced to come back and grow it the following year in 2023 in this case. 
And I do want to spend some time really kind of unpacking the 2022 harvest, but do either or both of you want to talk any more about your roles as plant breeders? No, I think just the, the role of a plant breeder for me is um, that being able to put together new hybrids. And so we see what, what's working in the growers fields now. We see what hybrids are there. Every hybrid in general has some sort of weakness or something that we wished it would be a little bit better. And the, the challenge of the great part about being a plant breeder is be able to go back and fix that thing. Um, the other amazing thing right now in the era that Don and I get to participate in plant breeding is the speed at which we increase yield levels is probably greater than we've any plant breeder or any um, growers have seen before us. And so the amount of yield that we're increasing and stabilizing on growers fields, uh, it's just a great time to be part of the ag industry and be part of plant breeding to watch us push the limits on how far we can um, increase, you know, tons of grain or tons of soy um, per acre, so. Probably one thing I would talk about in plant breeding, a, a piece that as I've gotten fuller into my career has become more evident to me is my contribution and Andy's contribution as plant breeders. Some of those things will be immediate uh, benefit to the to the farmer. And others of them will be a long-term benefit, you know, that our organization, that, that we're in charge of really being good stewards of our germplasm and continuing to improve it. Because I think back to the previous corn breeders or previous soybean breeders and how they improved the germplasm, brought something better into it, enriched it, so that it can be better for us to breed with. And that's really a big, big role that we have as well, is just continuing to build a better germplasm pool. Because even though our careers, maybe 30 or 40 years as plant breeders, uh, there's another plant breeder that's going to come behind us and continue to have to utilize this germplasm and continue to feed the world, make gains, and provide better products to customers. And so it's it's a it's a humbling process, but it's also uh, something that you can look back at and really feel proud uh, to be a part of as well. Yeah, you, you know the one last comment on it, on why mo many of us have become plant breeders. It's really is to help the growers, and so um, you. Many of us, it used to be to feed the world um, it, for a lot of us to get a steady paycheck. But for many of us that grew up in ag, it's about making sure that the, the corn and soy producers and the farmers throughout the corn belt um, can develop a steady income. And so being able to be a part of that and stabilize ag across years, um, the ag cycle and the growing cycle, that's just, you know, there's a lot of rewarding um, pieces to be a part of that. Well, this has just been a, a great conversation. A huge thank you to our guest today for this Pioneer Harvest Hangout, Andy Ross, a pioneer breeder and corn evaluation zone leader based in Iowa, and Don Kyle, also a pioneer breeder on the soybean side and a soybean evaluation zone leader based in Illinois. Don, Andy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. I'm Mark Dorenkamp for Brownfield Ag News, and you've been watching a Pioneer Harvest Hangout.